Hey, can I get everyone's attention for a second? Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dale Smith. I'm the Dean of the College of Business Administration. It's wonderful to be here and see so many people. Before I turn the program over to one of our distinguished accounting professors and our distinguished guest, I thought I would use this captive audience to do a plug for something very special next week that I hope we will get lots of you to do. The last men's basketball game against Santa Clara takes place on February 28th, next Thursday night. And we're having CBA night at Gersten. So I am hoping that you all will be there. There will be goodies I will be giving out to all of the CBA students who come. Last home came. If you're an alum or a student, come sit with us, come hang with us. Um, it's going to be a great game. There'll be a reception, sort of some tailgating beforehand. So we hope you will do that. So please open your email when it comes from the CBA, talking about CBA night at the basketball game. Next Thursday, Santa Clara, go Lions. And now back to you, Mahmoud. Okay. Well, good evening. Welcome to Polly Grosh Lecture Series. I should thank uh, our alumni and supporters and friends for their financial support of this event. I also want to thank uh, Natalie Durdek, uh, who is the uh, publicity manager for our college, and uh, uh, also uh, Nancy Donovan, who organizes our special events, and her students that help her a lot, Nanya, Ali, Katie, Patrick, Brett, and Diego. Thank you for your help. Uh, today, uh, we have also a CPE sign-up sheet for those who like to get their uh, continuing professional educations. They can sign up, and they will be given credit for this presentation. Our speaker tonight is Ms. Uh, Susan Maples, who is uh, the Franchise Tax Board uh, Taxpayer Rights ad Advocate and she's been also the auditor for Franchise Tax Board for many years. I am very thankful and grateful to her for being here tonight. And we are going to learn more about uh, California taxes and some differences between California and federal taxes, I think. Yep. Uh, welcome. Thank and you. This is yours now. OK. I'm going to yeah, yeah. I have that heads up. Thank you. It's good to be here tonight. Thanks, Mahmood, for that nice introduction. As Mahmood said, my name is Susan Maples, and I'm the Franchise Tax Board's Taxpayers' Rights Advocate. I've had that position for just over four years now, um, and it's been exciting. It's been challenging. It's been interesting to learn um, a lot about the perspective of taxes from folks like yourselves, tax professionals, people in the tax um, industry. And so I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to come out and speak to you, to speak to folks who have an interest in the, in the taxing system that we have here in the US and in California. And tonight, I'm going to share a little bit with you about the history of Franchise Tax Board, um, the different agencies that we have here in California, uh, some of the significant tax law changes that have occurred just recently. I'll kind of give you a little history back to 1986 when we had our first Tax Reform Act to now. Um, and also what to do, um, what, is, what the outcome of tax laws have. It's not only just about raising revenue, you know, for the state coffers to spend on um, taxpayer projects, but it's also about sometimes uh, economic behaviors, behavioral economics and, and encouraging people to do specific things, you know, based on tax laws. I'm also going to cover some information about who has to file and what happens when people don't file tax returns. Um, also, a little bit about where all the W-2 jobs have gone. I like to refer to this as the gig economy. I think the way that people are earning income has changed a bit, and that also changes the way tax laws work as well. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about fraud and identity theft. Um, I think most people want to know, is, do I have to worry about this? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. But in getting started, what I'd like to do is talk about the Taxpayers' Rights Advocate Office. And I didn't find, this must be the clicker here. Let's see if I can get this right. I apologize, we didn't cover this, and I'm not sure how to get it to move forward, so let's try that. Um, as the advocate, uh, we do a lot of important things. Um, I'm going to actually flip this upside down and start at the bottom with education and outreach, because education and outreach is really one of the most important things we do, because it helps people understand um, why they're paying taxes, which is increases voluntary compliance so people have a better understanding about where their money is going. 
but it also helps prevent taxpayer errors, which reduces that overall burden, because nobody wants to file a tax return only to get a notice from either the IRS or the Franchise Tax Board later on um, telling them that they've done something wrong, because then you have to continue that interaction with us. Sometimes that can be frustrating. Uh, sometimes it can be stressful. So with education outreach, we hope to reduce those burdens, and it's really one of the most important things that we do. Um, another really important thing we do as part of the Advocate's Office is provide assistance to folks. We're really that safety net or that lifeline, if you will. A lot of times when you're trying to get something accomplished with a government agency and normal channels just are failing, you're not getting, you're feeling as though you're not being heard or the person on the other end of the line is not willing to help you with whatever you need. Or sometimes you fall into that, I call it the virtual black hole. You're trying to get a hold of somebody to discuss an issue that you have and you just can't seem to get it resolved. That's really one of the most important things we do in advocate assistance is make sure that we're there, that we listen to you, that we help you with problems and try to get those things resolved. We're sort of that go-between, if you will, between the actual agency and the taxpayers. And so trying to help folks get issues resolved. Um, speaking of getting issues resolved, problem solving is another thing that we do in the advocate's office. There's a lot of systemic issues that we uncover which affect multiple taxpayers. Um, it might have to do with our policies and procedures at Franchise Tax Board. But as the Advocates Office, we really try to get in there and figure out what, what problems we're having, make sure that we can get a resolution for those things. Uh, some of the ways that we do that is through the Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing. Every December, we have a Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing where taxpayers, tax professionals, people involved in the tax industry, accounting professors, can come to the three-member franchise tax board, and that three-member board is made up of the state controller, the chair of the Board of Equalization, and the chair of the uh, Department of Finance. Talk to them about changes they'd like to see, whether that's changes in tax law or changes in uh, the way that we administer tax law or changes in policies at the agencies. That's one of the ways that we hear from taxpayers about what problems they're experiencing. And myself as advocate, I often follow up on those issues that are brought forward so that we can make the system work better for everyone. Uh, I also do an annual report to the legislature. So each year I follow issues that are brought to me as the advocate things that are brought up at the Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing, and I report on to the legislature changes that I think that we need to make as a tax agency. Um, so that's also a key piece of what the advocate does. Uh, we also have an independent review function. I don't know if you are aware of this. If you owe the IRS enough money, the IRS can take your passport. We can't do that at Franchise Tax Board, but what we do uh, do if you owe us enough money, if you're in what we call our top 500, and those are people who owe over $100,000, we can take your driver's license, and we can also take your professional license. So let's say, for example, you're a physician, and you find yourself on top of that list. Not only will we take your driver's license, but we will have the medical board suspend your medical license so that you no longer can you know, perform the, what you do to make money. Um, and it's fairly significant when people are faced with the reality that they can no longer you know, run their business, do their day-to-day -day activities, drive in their car, um, because the taxing agency has taken, um, you know, their, their license. And as the advocate, one of the, the um, things that they've put in place to ensure that that doesn't happen when it shouldn't is giving us an independent review. So my office, if requested by the taxpayer, can do an independent review of the actions taken by the board. Um, also things like if you are booted out of an installment agreement or denied an installment agreement, um, we can do an independent review to make sure that that was done justly. Um, and finally, let's talk a little bit about taxpayer rights. It's interesting, I come out, like I said, I do a lot of education outreach, and I often ask tax professionals and taxpayers if they know what rights the taxpayer has. And you'd be surprised how many times I'm uh, looked at with blank stares. Um, the most important one, I think, that people always have to remember is that you have the right to be treated with professionalness and courtesy. And professionalism is a key, and you should expect that whenever you're um, calling you know, the taxing agency. Also, privacy and confidentiality is huge as well. A lot of people will call on the phone. They don't have information about um, you know, their personal circumstances, whether that be you know, uh, AGI, which is your adjusted gross income, or other, you know, your social security number. You'd be surprised how many people don't know their social security number offhand. And they're calling asking questions, and we really put 
tax professionals as well as taxpayers through a lot of questions to make sure before we're talking to you about sensitive and confidential information that you're the person who you say you are. A lot of times, you know, your parent, your sibling, your you know, uh, son or daughter might call on your behalf and we cannot share that information with them unless we're certain that you have given them authorization. Privacy and confidentiality. It's a huge deal, especially you know when we get down, we'll talk a little bit about uh, fraud and identity theft. You have to keep those sensitive pieces of information, such as your social security number and other you know, financial information about yourself. We need to make sure that we're, we're treating those with the utmost respect and confidentiality, so we don't want those to get into the wrong hands. Um, speaking of which, the right to representation has become a little bit more problematic, given you know, the, the um, increase in rise in fraud and identity theft, because we want to make sure that anyone who calls on your behalf also has your authorization for us to give them your information or to talk with them about your tax situation. Um, and with representatives, you know, we have taken additional steps to make sure that if you have someone call on your behalf, that they are the person who has, um, that you have given that the uh, authorization to. And sometimes it takes more than a signature on a form. You know, it used to be if you just signed a form with the notary and whatever, we would accept that. Now, sometimes we have to call taxpayers and ask them, is this somebody that you have given your permission to uh, represent you? On another note, that right to representation has also been big for us recently because we've had um, some folks who've complained about the fact that people who have an act, the taxpayer who has an active power of attorney on file, a collector might call the taxpayer directly looking to get a payment. And from the perspective of the agency, it may not seem like that big of a deal, but we have a lot of people who have English as a second language, or maybe they're here you know, from a foreign country, and getting a call from somebody at a taxing agency um, is frightening. And they may end up paying we're looking down here, pay no more than the correct amount of tax owed. They may end up paying a tax that they don't actually owe because they're afraid of what might happen. This is why, you know, those IRS calls, anybody here gotten a call from the IRS that says, you know, pay us or we're going to put you in jail? Those are so successful because people are afraid of what will happen if the government comes after them. So as the advocate at Franchise Tax Board, I made sure that we put into a policy, uh, put a policy into place this past year that our folks cannot call a taxpayer if they have a representative on file, if they have an active power of attorney or a taxpayer information authorization and the, and the taxpayer has asked us to work with the representative, that that's who we work with. I'm still working on this in the agency because it's taking a while, I think, for folks to understand this is the taxpayer's right. If they have a representative, our agents can't just call a taxpayer and ask for payment, ask for returns, and essentially go around that representative. So that's been an issue for us this year. Uh, equity relief. As the advocate, sometimes things happen through no fault of the taxpayer, but there is no other way for the agency to provide any relief under the law. A lot of times as the advocate, people will say, well, can't you just make this go away? And unfortunately, I don't have a magic wand, and I cannot do anything that is contrary to the law. Um, but this particular provision does allow, if it is the fault of the taxing agency, the taxpayer hasn't contributed, there is a certain dollar threshold that I have to stay under, but I can provide some relief in those cases. Um, Finally, the, the protest appeals and judicial review, that's also known as due process. So this is what happened when you are audited by the Franchise Tax Board or if you receive a notice, you have the right to protest that if we're assessing additional tax. You also have the right, and the protest should be by someone who is independent, should be a second look at all the information that's been provided. You also have the right to appeal that assessment. Should you not prevail at protest, it goes on to an appeal. Interestingly enough, I was telling some of the folks I had dinner with tonight, um, as part of the Taxpayers Advocate Office, we just took over a tax appeal assistance program, and we have a clinic here at Loyola Law School, and we have the law students there who um, sign up for our internship, represent taxpayers at the Office of Tax Appeals. It's a really great program, but it's there, and the advocate, it's in the advocate's office because we really believe not only do you have 
to uh, the right to pay no more than the correct amount of tax, but we want people who can't afford representation to be able to at least receive some help with an appeal. So that's why we have that program. And, and that's really an important part of the process of you know, feeling as though you're being heard. If you are in, I, I call it a dispute, but if you have an issue with the tax agency where we're saying you owe additional money for whatever reason, you have the right to be heard. And, this is, and that due process, protest repeat, appeals and judicial review, is an extremely important important part of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And then again, as I mentioned, to pay no more than the correct amount of tax owed. This one is often interesting to me because I feel as though a lot of times when people are doing their tax returns, they'll skip a deduction. They'll ask their tax professional, should I take this deduction? Because if I do, won't that increase my chances for an audit? But what that also is doing is if you're not taking the deductions you're entire, entitled to, you're not paying, you're paying more than you probably should be because you're not taking something you're entitled to. So, you know, when we look at behavioral economics and we send out nudge letters and things, I don't know if you guys are familiar with behavioral economics, it's something that our department has really started doing. We will send folks letters about what qualifies, example, for example, uh, an itemized deduction or a charitable contribution in hopes of educating folks but for tax laws, it's a little bit different because on the flip side, people are so afraid of getting audited that they may forego a deduction that they are entitled to out of fear. And that's not what we want. So, you know, it's kind of a fine line with education and outreach and making sure that people understand, but also aren't afraid. So, okay, I'm gonna move on here. All right, so what should you do if you find yourself in need of advocate assistance? We have a fantastic website, it's ftb.ca.gov. You can search problem on our website and find additional information about how to obtain adv advocate assistance. We also have about 25 staff people that are there to help you. Again, it's if normal channels fail, if you're calling customer service, you're not getting the resolution you need. If you've got a collector who simply will not listen to your position or look at your documentation or whatever it is, you can always contact Advocate Assistance. And um, so there's, I put some information up there about where you can write, but again, it's all on our website. There's a lot of good stuff there. Most of you, you know, I see, have, I see a lot of you have computers up there. So that's where you would want to go. Always take a look at the website first because we have a lot of good information out there. All right. All right, so we're gonna move on now to a little history lesson here about the Franchise Tax Board. So the federal government started taxing its, its people in 1913. In California, though, we didn't get on that bandwagon until 1929. In 1929, we started with the Bank and Corporation Tax. In 1935 is when we started with income tax. So 1935 is how long California's been collecting income tax. We were the Franchise uh, Tax Commission before the Franchise Tax Board, but in 1950 is when they changed it to the Franchise Tax Board. And it's kind of interesting because um, I cannot tell you how often people will come and they'll ask me about their withholding, or they'll ask me about you know, a sales and use tax question. And I have to go back and explain that in California, we actually had, had three different taxing agencies, and I'll, and I'll get us into the current in a minute. Um, we had three taxing agencies for a really long time. They were the Board of Equalization, which handled sales and use tax, alcohol tax, gas tax, fire prevention fee. They basically had most of the taxes and fees at the Board of Equalization. Franchise Tax Board just had franchise and income tax, so business and, and individual income taxes. And then we had EDD, which is your payroll tax. Um, and those were the three entities. And since my 25 years at Franchise Tax Board, I can remember at least three times there were serious bills put forward to consolidate those taxing agencies. None of them have passed. Until 2017, we had a bill. But instead of reducing the number of tax agencies that we had in California, now we have five. So that one was called the Taxpayer Transparency and Fairness Act of 2017. And what that did was reorganize the Board of Equalization into not one, but three entities. So they split off into the California Department of Tax and Fee, which still handles sales and use tax, and a lot of the taxes and fees that I just mentioned. They kept the Board of Equalization because it's a constitutional board, so they couldn't just abolish it. They still have property taxes and a couple of fees. I think they might have an alcohol tax or something in there. 
Um, and then we created the Office of Tax Appeals. So that is a new, brand new state agency that is taking, has taken over the adjudicatory. My, oh wait, maybe we're back. Um, taking over the adjudicatory function of the appeals process. So they hear sales and use tax appeals as well as franchise and income tax appeals. So that's a brand new agency. It is another reason why I'm so um, excited about the, 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 law, the tax appeal assistance program that we have with the law students because this new agency seems to be a lot more geared towards, um, I guess, courtroom type procedure where you know you have a, you can have a witness and people can be subpoenaed and I thought to myself in in as they started putting forth all these regulations and going to some of these hearings I was thinking to myself as a taxpayer I can't imagine having to write my own brief I don't even know what goes in a brief or how to write a brief um, but having to go in front of an agency like that and try to and try to represent myself as not being an attorney as being a CPA, I thought this this would be pretty um, you know this might be a pretty big hill I'd have to climb, and it it would not be something I'd want to do alone. So, but anyway, they have this new Office of Tax Appeals, um, and those are kind of the five state agencies that we have now in California. All right, so moving on, tax reform of 1986. Back before. Uh, 1986, we used to have a standalone tax return in California. Um, many folks have asked that we go back to the standalone tax return based on all of the tax cuts and job acts changes that have gone on. Unfortunately, though, and this was back in the Reagan era, and it was interesting as I was looking at this because one of the reasons why they had the Tax Reform Act of 1986 was to make taxes simpler. And I think that's what Trump said. Although having gone through some training on all the changes that have been made, I think it's anything but simpler. I think he said he was going to put it on a postcard. I'm not sure that that postcard really um, came to fruition either. <laughs> but uh, it was supposed to be simpler. And the tax reform of 1986 was also supposed to be simpler. So what California did to get on board was uh, put together two uh, code sections, 19581 and 19582, which said that California, to make things simpler, would start with the federal AGI and itemized deductions and then make state adjustments as a result. So that's the system that we have today. We affectionately call it the piggyback tax return system because you have to start with the federal before you can even fill out your state return. But what it's created with tax cuts and job backs is a little bit of a nightmare. Um, and of course, you know, now our tax return has gone from like two pages to five pages. It's gotten a lot bigger. And while the department, our department, Franchise Tax Board, generally supports conformity, it's important to note that we don't actually recommend tax law. Tax law happens either at the California State Legislature or increasingly it seems to happen by propositions. Um, so, and let me give you an example of and how difficult conformity is. So, you know, long since 1986, that's when we, you know, the, the IRS changed its tax code, and we went to the piggyback system. Anytime the IRS makes changes, California actually has to pass a law. And something that I've learned, frustratingly, of course, it's just been, as the advocate, is that when we want to make changes, no matter how important I think that they are, Everything at that every bill that goes, you know, is presented or put on the House floor, Senate floor, uh, has a dollar value associated with it. So one of the great things that the IRS did, I want to say it was like 12 or 13, they had the Fresh Start program. One of the things that came along with the Fresh Start program was first-time penalty abatement. First-time penalty abatement is something a lot of folks call me and ask me about. It's often used for things like, I filed my return late, you know, it's, it can be a hefty penalty, or I made, you know, late payments, um, and I want to get the penalty waived. And a lot of times they'll call the IRS, and the IRS will say, yep, first-time penalty abatement, you know, gone. We cannot do that at Franchise Tax Board, and we have tried to submit many bills to get us into that conformity with the IRS. The first time around, I want to say it cost $30 million, and that was pretty much a non-starter. I think this year, you know, we've, we try every year to get a bill passed. This year, the bill that they have for California um, is not for businesses at all. It's only personal income tax, and I think they've now said it's a lifetime. Once in your lifetime can you use this first time. We're calling it first time penalty abatement. Because with the IRS, it's every three years. So every three years, you kind of start over again, and it's a first time. 
Um, but in order to bring the cost down, that's what we've done for California. We are looking for an author at the moment. I think we might actually have an author. Um, but trying to get bills passed to make the tax system a little bit easier or fairer, oftentimes it's difficult because it really relates to how much is this going to cost. And then also, if it raises a $1 of tax for anyone, it requires a two-thirds vote at the Capitol. And that sometimes can be a, just a huge hurdle to get over. So... Um, conforming to IRS changes has been difficult for many, many years. Um, but, and again, because a lot of times it's because it costs so much money. And so at my Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing this past December, we had a few folks who, who asked, why can't we just go back to a standalone return? Um, but unfortunately, the way the law is written now, we can't simply go back to standalone return. Again, it would have to be uh, legislated. And then, of course, you know, if we're going back to a standalone return, it's, it, it all boils down to dollars and cents. You know, what, what kind of taxes are we going to keep? What are we going to get rid of? How much is this going to cost? Et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, Federal Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Um, I would say, you know, often people ask me, well, what do you think is going to be the biggest problem? And I'm going to tell you right now, the biggest problem has been getting people to check their withholding. Uh, I actually decided to myself, I'm going, to, I'm going to, you know, check my own withholding. It took me four times sitting down in front of my computer to get it done. The first time I was at work, and it asked me for my AGI, and I thought, oh, darn, I don't have a tax return at work. I'm going to have to go home and figure this out. I get home. I get a little farther into it. It wants to know, you know, the withholdings that I had last year and this year. You know, what's on my check. It just took a lot more than I really thought it was going to take to check my withholding. And at the end of the day, I realized that I was going to be about $3,000 under withheld. At least that's what this particular tool told me. Um, and I wasn't too thrilled about that. I'm gonna, not going to lie. I was not happy. But getting people to check their withholding, even though the IRS has been telling people to do it, we've been telling people to do it, has been very difficult to get, to get the response that we need. Um, and the other thing has to do with um, financial literacy around refunds. Because, you know, there's this, working in the tax industry for so long, I found, you know, talking to tax professionals, a lot of people use their tax refund as a forced savings. They use it to pay their property taxes. Um, and I have been telling people for quite a long time that getting a refund is not a good thing because you have just given the government an interest-free loan all year. And most people can use that in their paycheck every month. So that's what the administration did. They cut your taxes and they also cut your withholding so that you could see more of that money in your check every year. But people see their refunds go down, or if they were one of those folks like me who was pretty much at a zero every year, and now I'm, I'm owing money because they've cut my withholding, um, seeing people only really look at what the refund is and they think that that is, um, you know, whether or not their tax professional was good based on the amount of refund that they got. Or, you know, they don't, they're not really looking at the actual amount of tax that they're paying. And so financial literacy around taxes is always difficult, but when it comes to, like, the Tax Cuts and Job Act, the interesting thing is I may owe, you know, a lot of money at the end of the day, but when I looked at my effective tax rate, guess what? It went down. And it was the same thing for my parents, who I tried, had to try to explain this to, because their effective tax rate went down. And I said, if you look at the actual tax that you paid, you'd see it's actually less than it was last year, because the tax rates changed at the federal level. And it's interesting, you know, oftentimes I'll talk to folks about the fact that we have a system wherein it's based on your ability to pay. So the more money that you make, the higher your tax rate, because it's that perceived ability to pay. The lower that your tax rate is, it's because you're making less on that scale, the perceived ability to pay is lower. And a lot of people think that's not fair. We had a discussion at dinner about a flat tax. That's never going to happen. Um, and it's the way that the system has been built for years and years and years. Um, and it doesn't, you know, sometimes for folks, they don't, you know, think that it's fair. They don't think that or they feel like they're paying too much or that person's getting a break. And, you know, I'm not, I'm paying more than I should be paying. I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about that when I get to the next slide on social and economic influences. 
But that's the kind of thing that we've been faced with conformity. It's a lot of questions and it's a lot of unknowns. Um, itemized deductions as we know it is gone pretty much. I and I I don't know, you know, what other people are doing, but I ended up this year taking the standard deduction because they pretty much doubled it at the federal level, which means a lot of people don't itemize for state purposes. When you're itemizing, it's things like charitable contributions. So guess who complained the loudest about the when they were talking about the proposals for the federal tax cuts and job acts? Charities, they do not want charitable deductions to go away because a lot of people make decisions based on tax effect, tax outcome. You know, would you give as much to your charity if it wasn't tax deductible? A lot of people, you know, think about that. They'll ask, when somebody asks you to donate money, you, ought, you know, you, if you're concerned about taxes, you'll ask, well, is it tax deductible? Can I get a receipt? You know, you're donating to Goodwill. You want all those receipts because you're going to deduct that stuff. Would you donate all that stuff to Goodwill if it wasn't tax deductible or would you give it somewhere else? <laughs> so a lot of things, you know, with the itemized deductions and what people are getting, it, it leads to... Uh, behavior, behavioral changes. Um, and itemized deductions are, you know, have been a long-standing thing for especially people in high-tax states like California. And in fact, California didn't have, in the legislature, didn't have any bills this year at all addressing conformity, other than a couple of ones that I thought were, uh, I couldn't figure it out, that had to do with state and local taxes. Some way you could donate to a charity and perhaps get a dollar for dollar credit. You could take a charitable contribution on your federal tax return, but still get you know credit on your state. And it was really, I don't, it didn't hold any water, which is why they didn't go anywhere. And the IRS had threatened to, um, to quash anything that the states might pass. But that's been a huge deal for a lot of people. It's what um, really pushed people, you know, into home ownership was the deduction for mortgage interest. You know, they're trying to get people to, to do certain things because of tax law. Tax laws convince people to do things a certain way because they're going to save money or it's going to be cheaper. It's motivation. Um, but with the Federal Tax Cuts and Job Act, in terms of you know, spurring on business, they have these new 199A deductions, which is generally allowing a 20% deduction for business income. You know, they're trying to motivate certain things. You know, I, I know that this administration is really interested in creating jobs, and I think this might be something that's trying to help move that along. So you have to think about that when, when different uh, tax laws are passed or different cuts are made, um, you know, and based on, you know, what are, what are they trying to, to encourage in the economy? Um, I was calling this year the perfect storm because so many changes have been made. And in addition to that, you know, we've had the government shutdown. We've had um, uh, all of these conformity changes. And a lot of folks also rely on software to do their taxes. The software vendors, I mean, a lot of tax professionals, you know, they really do rely. And I think this year in particular are going to have to rely on the software to help them figure out what to do. Um, in fact, I can't remember the last time I did my tax return on pencil and paper. It's probably been 15 years since you, since you could literally you know, get a tax form and do it by hand. Because tax laws are so complicated and every time they make changes, it becomes that much more complicated. And with the Tax Cuts and Job Act, California, except for a few of the um, retirement you know, for, that has to do with the uh, IRAs, Roths, what, what have you, we automatically conform to those provisions, but almost everything else we don't. So now in California, you might be getting this 20% you know, business income deduction, but in California, you're not getting that. At the federal level, you're getting this great standard deduction, but in California, you're not getting that. So you're going to be still itemizing or getting a much smaller standard deduction in California. In fact, at the Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing, that was one of the things that you know, folks had suggested, is that if we're going to look at conformity, why not look at raising the standard deduction, as opposed to trying to piecemeal conformity into some of these items um, for itemized deductions. So it will remain to be seen. We had at FTB, we had a, a conformity meeting. Um, we held one for both individuals and businesses to determine what people thought were the most pressing conformity items. For individuals, it was really about itemized deductions and, and not having to try to keep two sets of books. For business entities, it was really about uh, cash versus accrual accounting. Now, at the, for the IRS purposes, there are some businesses that can use a cash basis. 
in California, it's still accrual. And just trying to keep two sets of books. You guys are accounting majors. You can probably imagine what a nightmare that would be. Um, so those were really the two things, and I think technical terminations for partnerships and whatnot. There was, I think those, those were the main issues for federal conformity that I am looking for, hopefully this year, to um, encourage our legislative friends to take a closer look at, but I'm also gonna wait for this filing season to really see what issues come up, because I think that there will be some things um, with, for example, 1031 exchanges and uh, not other than real property, some particular issues where we might find that we need to, to push harder for certain legislation or conformity or some fix, but I'm really waiting to get through this filing season to see what kind of fixes we really need to push forward in the legislature. So that's kind of what FTB is doing on that matter. All right. Social and economic influences. Mm. Let's talk about raising taxes for a minute. One of the most common things I hear from taxpayers, and I talk to a lot of taxpayers on a daily basis, the most common thing I hear is it's not fair. Why do I have to pay this? Why am I being penalized? You know, what, who passed this tax? This is the most ridiculous thing. You know, why are we doing this, et cetera. It's basically underlying it's not fair. Um, and a lot of times I have to stop and, you know, talk about the greater good and I find myself sometimes in my office and I'm thinking, I'm having this discussion again with a taxpayer who really just wants their, their issue fixed and they probably don't want to hear, you know, all of this other stuff. But I feel like, you know, if I can help you at least understand, it goes back to education and outreach, if I can at least help you figure out or understand what the money that you're paying is going towards and that everyone is treated the same. You know, anybody who files late gets the late filing penalty. I mean, it's not just you. It's, you know, anyone who does the same, who has the same action. Um, I was telling one taxpayer recently, I said, you know, let's talk about property taxes for a minute because, you know, I talk about income taxes all day long. I said, I got my property tax bill, and the amount that I'm paying for public schools just about doubled. And I said, you know, I'm sending my kids to a private school, so I'm paying for private school, and I'm paying property taxes. And I thought, you know, I didn't vote for any property tax increase. It's not really fair. But when you look at the greater good, it's kind of like the tax situation. I don't generally call the fire department, but if my house burns down, I want them to come. So I pay taxes, and I understand that it's, you know, taxes, roads, schools, all the things that taxes go to. But who makes the decision about who's paying the tax and how much it should be? Most of the time, it ends up being the legislature. But interestingly enough, there are a lot of taxes that are put forward to you to vote on. An example of that is Proposition 39. Well, actually, let's start with Prop 13, because that's pretty easy. Property taxes. We have low, low property taxes in the state because I think it was in 70-something, 70 76 or something. We passed Prop 13. And then once a proposition is passed, it's not like the uh, legislature can go back and, and change that. It is, it is there until voters decide that they want to change it. But then we have things like this one recently. It was 2013, Prop 39, which is a single sales factor. Now, I mean, when we look at things like gas tax or property tax, I think most people can wrap their heads around what those taxes are and what it means to vote yes or no. But when you think about things like proper, single sales factor, so I'll just give you, a, for anyone who doesn't know what single sales factor is, we treat apportioning business entities, the way we calculate the tax is based on property, payroll, and sales. It used to be a four-factor formula, so you double-weighted sales. And then you had how much property they had in this, you know, in California, how much payroll was in California over the total. So it was a, you know, a, a factor formula. They put a bill on the uh, proposition, you know, in front of voters to tax businesses on a single sales factor. That's also just your sales factor in California. How many people do you think really knew what they were voting on or what effect that would have on taxes and businesses? Probably not many. I mean, you see that whatever propaganda is provided, you know, in the pros and cons, if you even bother to read the book. But sometimes they will put these things in front of voters. Another one is the mental health services tax. We have an extra 1% on folks who make over a million dollars in California. It's the mental health services tax. That was also voted on by folks. 
Um, and it's, sometimes it's easy, I think, because it's like, well, that doesn't affect me. We can raise taxes. I, I want to help mental health services, and I'm not over a million dollars, so I'm not going to have to pay that 1%. So that sounds great. I'm going to check yes. Um, but then, you know, you get to a situation where, you, like I said, you have people calling, and they're saying, well, this isn't fair, that isn't fair, you know. And I don't necessarily know that the tax system is supposed to be fair, but it does need to be equitable in terms of the way that folks are treated. So oftentimes I'm telling, you know, people who are calling my office, like, I know that this does not seem fair, but it is across the board, people are treated equitably. And if you want to change the process, you have to get involved. You have to vote. You have to figure out what's, you know, who you're voting for. You know, look at these things. You guys are in accounting. Um, I don't know that you'll necessarily all go into tax. And after tonight, maybe some of you will, maybe <laughs> some of you won't. Um, but being involved in this process and understanding how it works and that a lot of times it's, it's not just the legislature, but it's voters getting involved as well. And besides, let's face it, raising taxes, especially on certain groups, is, can be wildly unpopular. And so um, it's difficult, I mean, for the legislature to determine. And they're trying to fund a budget. So if they raise taxes, they have more money for those other more popular programs. So sometimes that's how we end in the boat that we, we're ending up in. But also tax law is supposed to entice behavior. We have the earned income tax credit, which is a tax credit when it first rolled out three or four years ago. I, it was, I think you had to make less than $13,000 a year in order as a single person in order to qualify. And I thought, who is, no one's filing a tax return. I have a slide a little bit later that talks about whether or not I have to file. These folks are not filing tax returns. Why would we put a welfare program, that burden on taxpayers who don't have a filing requirement to begin with? Because now they gotta go find a tax professional, probably pay to have their taxes done in order to get the money back. And it wasn't wildly successful in the first year. So the next year they sort of, they've increased the amounts for folks who can qualify. They also expanded it to people who had self-employed businesses. That's another thing I'm going to talk about in a little bit, is the gig economy and the way that people are earning money. So those po folks that are Uber driving or, you know, um, TaskRabbit or any of those, you know, gig economy type platforms, those folks could also apply for the earned income tax credit. And they've expanded even more to lower the age and up the income so that more and more people could qualify so that these people are getting refunds back, even if they're not paying it, and it's a refundable credit which means that they don't actually have to be paying any tax to get money back. All they have to do is file a return. And getting those folks to file a return um, can be difficult, if, especially if they didn't have a filing requirement before. But we also have things um, like mortgage deductions, as I mentioned, designed to get to increase home ownership, charitable contributions, designed to increase the charitable giving. Um, and then also, you know, like I had mentioned with the, uh, uh, or I, did, I guess I didn't mention, the college access credit is another one. To get people to donate to college funds, they have the college act access credit so that people can donate and then get a deduction for donations that they make that support schools. So trying to encourage behavior through the tax code is, is oftentimes what happens. It's enticing behaviors. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Civic responsibility. Do I have to file? I think this is often the question I get, especially from people who are in college. Do I have to file? And what happens if I don't file? Um, so right now, the let's see. Uh, if you are under age 65, it's $14,138. That's all you have to make to have a filing requirement in California. Um, if you're married, it's $28,276. Um, but what often happens, the most common the most common error that we see, uh, based on dollar amount, not on number, but on dollar amount, is people failing to file tax returns. That is the, by, by uh, dollar amount of notices issued, that is the most common error that we see. So you might ask yourself, um, how do they know if I don't file my return? One of the biggest ways, obviously, that we know that people don't file returns is because we get documents, W-2s, 1099s. We get uh, information from cities about business licenses. So if you register, if you have a business and you get a business license and you fail to file a tax return, we get that information from the city. And if we do not find a Schedule C or you just you file a tax return and omit the Schedule C, we're going to send you a letter that says you have a business license and didn't file a, didn't file a Schedule C. 
But, but cities also do the same thing. If you file a Schedule C and don't have a business license, they get that information from us. So we have some sharing that goes on. If you have a business and you file a sales and use tax return but fail to file an income tax return, you'll get a filing enforcement from us. Um, and we are pretty good at, at finding these things. We also have things called economic indicators. This was also an issue at the Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing that I had in December. Because the economic indicator filing enforcements can be very burdensome to folks. So we were talked if you had, about if you had a license. So this happens a lot, I think, with real estate licenses. It does happen with attorneys and CPAs occasionally who move out of state. But if you have a business license in California and you fail to file a return, we do a fancy calculation based on the area that you live in and what kind of license you have to calculate what, you, what, your, what we think would be your income had you filed a tax return. And we will send out a notice that says, we think you owe X amount of dollars based on this, this license. Um, and oftentimes what happens is people will keep their license because if like they're a CPA like me, I move out of state, I'm gonna keep my California CPA license. I'm gonna keep it active because I might move back or might need it for whatever reason. But I don't bother to change my address with the Franchise Tax Board because I don't live in California anymore and I don't have a filing requirement. So I don't change my address. So the last known address that we have is a California address, but now, but I still have a license and I've moved out of state. So oftentimes what happens is we will send a letter to that last known address with that amount that we've calculated as the proposed assessment. And when I don't respond and you know several notices, due process goes by, eventually they will attach my bank account because we have, it's called a financial institution's records match. We can take any debtor with a social security number if, as long as they have a bank that has a branch in California. So I could have opened my bank account at Bank of America in New York, but if Bank of, bank of America has lots of branches here, they can submit my social security number, and voila, the next thing you know, an order to withhold goes out, or a levy, I'm sorry, it's called a levy. A levy in the bank account goes out, and then I get a notice from the bank saying, oh, you owe Franchise Tax Board X amount of dollars. Um, and so this type of thing causes, again, a lot of you know, uh, frustration, a lot of stress for folks who get these kinds of uh, notices from us. But it is one way that we ensure that people who have a filing requirement are actually filing return. Another one we do with the economic indicators is mortgage interest. So if you have a mortgage interest that seems high enough and you're not filing a return, because we get those 1099s from the banks that are paying, that are you know, sending you the information about the mortgage interest through the loan that you have, we will also send notices of proposed assessments on that as well. So we have a lot of different ways to ensure that people are filing tax returns. And if you're not filing a tax return and we feel like you have a filing requirement, you get that, those lovely letters from us. Um, so um, let's see. Oh, These are the folks, though, that we have, you know, I had mentioned the gig economy. If you are working in these types of industries, I think Uber is pretty good. They're issuing the 1099. But we have a lot of people now who are not so much with the W-2 jobs anymore. Or they have a W-2 job, but they've got all of these side businesses going on. And I think we looked at like the top 100 of these, of these type platforms. And the problem with a lot of them is that they do not issue a 1099. So we have a voluntary... Um, we have a voluntary tax compliance system, meaning it's voluntary unless you get a filing enforcement from us. But for the most part, you're supposed to file a tax return and tell us how much you owe. But what happens if you've done a bunch of work for, you know, you're selling stuff on Etsy, maybe you're selling stuff on eBay, maybe you've, you know, been driving a little bit Uber because you don't have anything else to do and you, you don't want to, you know, socialize with people or whatever it is. Um, and you don't get any tax documents from them at the end of the year telling you how much you made. This happens a lot. And, and um, trying to get people to report something if they're not sure exactly how much they made. It's one of the things, you know, we talk about legislation, trying to get legislators, to, legislative folks to look at uh, expanding the use of the 1099-K. A 1099-K is a document that folks get. You, I think eBay and those kinds of places issue them. They, well, they have to. You have to have uh, more than $20,000 in income 
or I think 200 transactions. So it's a fairly high level. Some states have decided that they don't, um, that they wanted to lower that level more because a regular 1099, I think it's if you make $750 or more, you 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 know required to get a 1099. So we're looking at trying to um, impose those 1099, a lower threshold of 1099Ks for a lot of these platforms so that people are getting information about how much money that they made so that they can fulfill their responsibility to file a correct tax return. But it's it can be kind of difficult, especially you know when people are thinking about, I don't know, I did crowdfunding this year because I wanted to do a startup. Is that money taxable? You know, what do I do with that? Um, am I an independent contractor? You know, there's self-employment taxes from a lot of this stuff. If you're filing a Schedule C, um, one of the things that we do when we go out to the small business, I mentioned earlier that I have a small business liaison, and um, he goes out and talks to people about starting a business. Am I a sole proprietor? Should I be a partnership? Should I be an LLC? You know, what do I need um, protection from if I'm an LLC? You know, liability protection, those kinds of things. Um, but being an independent contractor, you know, and having to pay self-employment tax on all of the income that you make selling stuff on Etsy or, you know, being an Uber driver, any of those types of things. There's a lot of questions that people have. Um, but receiving tax documents, we know, is one of the most effective ways to ensure self-compliance. And it helps you to know exactly how much money you made. And it helps us to know exactly how much money you made. So that when you file a return, um, we can help you or we can make sure that you, you know, you're putting the right amount on there. And it helps if you have a tax professional, when you, if you have forms to take to your tax professional. Um, a lot of people who start small businesses or get into you know, any of these kind of gig economy type things, it's usually because they have a really great idea. Maybe they're really good at making jewelry or selling paintings or you know, uh, playing an instrument or whatever, teaching other people how to play an instrument. They're not so good at finances. And so when it comes time at the end of the year to figure out what all those expenses were, they're not keeping good books and records. So if I can share anything with you guys tonight as you move into your careers, if you're doing things that are small business related, you know, entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial type stuff, find yourself a good bookkeeper, accountant, make sure you keep records or have somebody keeping records for you and giving you financial advice, helping you with the business plan, making sure that you know if you're the person with the great ideas and the drive to create something, that you have somebody there behind you helping you with the finance piece along the way. Because a lot of times businesses, even though they're great businesses, go out of business because there wasn't anyone there to really help them succeed in terms of a financial picture. And that's super, super important, you know, when you are starting something up, making sure that you have the financial wherewithal to keep it going. So, okay. All right. Let's talk about the personal income taxes filed. Um, personal income tax returns filed. We have roughly 18 million taxpayers in uh, California, it, personal income, individual income taxpayers. Um, it says 19.5 returns in there because even though last year we got 19.5 million tax returns, we actually only um, had 18 million original. The rest were either prior year returns or amended returns coming in. Um, and it's also interesting, I was telling some of the folks at dinner that we the, have changed the way that we process tax returns at Franchise Tax Board. Everything is done electronically now. Uh, we have an online platform so you can get your own account. We um, don't keep any paper anymore. And everything that comes in to Franchise Tax Board is scanned and then it's shredded and then it's uploaded to a taxpayer's what we call folder, but it's an electronic folder. Um, so, and we have a lot of tax returns that come in. We have 18 million, you know, current year returns that we process each year, which is quite a bit. If, if you can imagine how much paper. Back in the old days, we used to have these trucks and trucks of, of tax returns. We had a whole warehouse just full of paper, and we've pretty much gotten rid of all of that. We're trying to get into the, I guess, the 21st century here with electronics. Um, the number of tax professionals you preparing tax returns. It's something that I have been keeping really close tabs on. Um, and it started, when I started, it was about 70-30. It's now down to about 65-35. Um, so 65% of tax returns in California are done by a paper pair. Only 35% 30, are done by people doing it themselves. Often, almost always using software, because as I mentioned earlier, I don't think you can do it pen and pencil anymore. 
Um, but we have a few people who try. Um, and those are usually the most common part of it. They're part of the most common errors um, that are made. We see if they're trying to do it on paper. <laughs> Um, but yeah, about 35% of the, of the tax returns are done by people who are doing it themselves. And interestingly enough, it's not that there are less people using a tax preparer, but each year we increase the number of taxpayers that we have in California, and those people must be doing it themselves because the number of people using a paid preparer has not gone down. But the percentage of people who are self-preparing is going up. So you might wanna, you might ask yourself, why would I wanna use a paid preparer? Paid preparers have a lot of good things um, to offer folks, especially when it comes to complex tax returns. It, I mean, they really can help you, guide you, as I mentioned earlier with the small businesses, you know, or, and, or any kind of financial decisions that you're going to make. Oftentimes you'll see, you know, anytime you go to a, a marketing piece for uh, insurance or, you know, um, some of these mortgage things that they're selling, it'll always tell you to contact your tax professional because it's complicated. And having a tax professional help you with your taxes can be important if you have a business or a complicated you know, a tax return to file. But a lot of people are doing it themselves. And one of the things that we have seen as well is that tax software sometimes always isn't as easy as it could be to use. I was um, mentioning to some friends as well that I um, do some tax returns for myself and for my parents. Those are the only two that I do. Um, and doing, using the software, it can be confusing. On, and I'm a tax professional, if you will, tax professional. I use that term loosely because I don't actually prepare returns. But it can be difficult to, to navigate the tax, the, the software, and figuring out whether or not it's correct, what question they're asking you, what it's uh, wanting you to do. And so um, if you're going it alone, you know, using software can be, it can be a good experience, and you can and most people are successful in doing it, but I've seen a lot of taxpayers who will use software and then realize that they don't, they're you know, at a point where they need help. They're not, you know, they, they don't know exactly what the software is trying to ask. The law is pretty confusing as it is, and they need to get some you know, additional help. Having a tax preparer can be a good thing. Um, but I am seeing as we get in you know, more taxpayers who are coming into California, the, it seems to be that the um, the newer folks that are coming in are, are doing it themselves. And so we're seeing a decrease in the number of tax professionals that are, um, that are coming into the market as well. I went to Las Vegas this summer. Mm. I went to Las Vegas this summer and there was a number of tax professionals there that had just gotten into the industry. And I had one gal come up to my um, table and she wanted to know she had failed to file an LLC return which is a 568 in California, because she, her business was an LLC. Um, and I said to her, I said, you're a tax professional? And she said, yeah, I just, I didn't realize I filed a Schedule C on my return, uh, my, my federal return, and I didn't know that I, as a single member, that I needed to file a separate return for California. And I was really surprised um, at how she could be a tax professional and not know this. And I'm sharing this story with you because if you're thinking about using a tax professional, you really need to vet who it is. There are, there are lots and lots of good tax professionals out there, but when you think about the fact that you're giving over all of your personal information to a tax professional, um, you should do some investigation as to you know, how uh, how well they do at preparing taxes. Um, either get friends' suggestions, go online, you know, if you're doing an a enrolled agent or CTEC registered, in order to prepare California taxes, you either have to be uh, certified by the California Tax Education Council, you have to have an EA license, you have to be a CPA or an attorney. One of those four things. Everyone who pays or who accepts money to prepare a tax return in California must have one of those designations and must do continuing education. But that doesn't mean all tax preparers know what they're doing. Clearly from the, the explanation I gave you about the gal in Las Vegas, you really need to vet these folks before you just hand over your stuff to them. Make sure that they know what they're doing. Um, also another thing that you can use in California, well actually anywhere, is the Voluntary Income Tax Assistance Program, which is also known as VITA. We have a, you can go on our website, I think you might even be able to go on the IRS website, get information about free tax prep assistance. We often are telling folks if they can't afford a, a tax preparer and they don't want to try the software thing because it is so complicated that there is some free assistance out there, 
We're, we've been uh, doing a lot more marketing of VITA just because of the earned income tax credit as well. I mentioned that earlier. Um, allowing folks to have free preparation of software. Um, but the size of your refund should not be a determining factor in how you choose a tax professional. Oftentimes, you know, people will go in, well, this tax preparer can get me a much larger refund than that tax preparer. That is not, that is not a good way to choose a tax preparer, but you'd be surprised at how many people um, think that the size of their refund is, you know, means that they have a really good preparer. Um, and I know preparers get really frustrated about this kind of thing too because they want to do your taxes right and they need to, you know, by law, they're required, uh, their certification, they have ethics requirements, they have to do the tax returns right. And oftentimes they'll find taxpayers who want a certain thing, they want certain deductions and when they're told, you know, that's, you can't do that, they'll find someone else. So we also at Franchise Tax Board have a really big tax preparer fraud program where we look for these people who are taking deductions that they shouldn't be taking or doing other things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and that's a huge program for us as well. We also find that a lot of, that there are tax preparers in certain uh, communities that are, uh, where English is the second language that um, take advantage of those folks because they also don't know, um, divert refunds, all kinds of crazy things. Um, so but it's really important if you are using a tax professional that you vet that person, that you trust that person, that you get good references from that person, and that you make sure that they are a licensed professional because it's, it is the law in California and it also will protect you by making sure that you look for their license and make sure that their license is still valid. Okay. I'm gonna move on here to communicating with FTB. Um, we, like I mentioned, we have a really great website. Um, you can find out a lot of stuff there. You can do a lot of research if you have questions. Tax Cuts and Job Act, Tax Cuts and Job Act, not so much, just because it's those federal changes. And as I mentioned, California really doesn't conform to much of any of that. So you're not gonna find a lot of information about federal tax changes there. But you can get information from, um, from our website about California. And I wanted to, I have a, I had a uh, reference for a publication here. I was gonna, oh. Uh, if you do need to know more about the Tax Cuts and Job Act, or if you're having trouble sleeping at night, IRS 5307 Tax Reform Basics can be very helpful for specific tax situations. I was looking, I was looking at this uh, Tax Reform Basics because I was trying to figure, I told you my kids go to a private school whether or not I should be taking money out of their 529 to pay for, you know, if it was, if it was even a, you know, a good possibility, which it, it's not. But looking, you know, at, at things like that, because changes in tax law, again, motivate people to behave a little bit differently economically because of the tax situation. So you, you look through those things and, and think about, well, which ones apply to me? Which things would I take advantage of? Which things would I not take advantage? Of. But anyway, that's a great publication. But I always say, if you're if you can't sleep at night, because you know usually two paragraphs into it, I'm yawning. Um, call center. We have a we have a, a number of call centers. All of that information is on our website. What I really want to skip down to is MyFTB, because that is relatively new for Franchise Tax Board. We rolled it out right after I got this job, like 2015. 2016, actually, I think was the first year. Um, and it is an online account that you can use. It has all your tax information in there. Registering it for it is not as easy of a, a process because of identity theft. It takes a little bit more time. And I thought, you know, well, we're going to get out there. I'm going to go. We went to a state fair. We were going to try to um, sign people up. The problem is you have to know your AGI. So I've been really trying to enlist tax professionals to get their clients to sign up for my FTB. And you might be asking yourself, why do I want to sign up for a my FTB account? I really don't want anything to do with Franchise Tax Board except for twice you know, a year when I file my return and when I get my refund. Um, but it's really, I think, a good thing for you to sign up for a my FTB account even if you never use it for, for, one, for one main reason, and that is identity theft and fraud. Um, there are still, although fraud has kind of, I think it's peaked and come down a little bit, there is still a lot of reason to be concerned about tax fraud. You know, once your information gets stolen, um, it's really hard to, you know, get back to something normal after that. 
Um, and the MyFTB account will at least let you know if somebody files a return on your behalf. Because you get you have to put in your email address. It's all done online. You put in your email address, and so it will tell you when, when somebody accesses the account, if somebody tries to become an authorized representative for you, um, anything, you know, if, or if you just want to check your tax status or where your refund is, you can do this all through MyFTB. But the important thing is that once you create an account, no one else can do it for you. And that's the big deal. I don't think we're at a point, as the advocate I originally had said, I wanted them to make sure that people could turn it off if they didn't want it. Because we've had issues with, um, with tax professional accounts and adding clients and uh, you know, the whole confidentiality and, and privacy piece of it just because of fraud and identity theft. And we've had to make it a lot more secure, which is why I say if you have your own account, no one else can create one for you. It's like I said, it's a little bit cumbersome because you have to know your adjusted gross income in order to do it. You know your social security number, basic your basic information, which you know. Once you input all that information, you have to wait for FTB to send you a um, PIN number so that you complete the activation. And the reason that you have to wait for the PIN number is even though I said we're trying to get in the 21st century, for us the holy grail is still that address of record. It's the one that you provided to us on a return. And we will not allow anyone to change your address unless we've affirmed that it's you or an authorized representative, which we vet very well now, to make sure that they can't just change your address. So you should really consider, um, even if you're not in the tax field, never intend on being in the tax field, you're all California taxpayers, at least probably for the moment. Get your own MyFTB account so that you know and you can keep an eye on it. Um, it's just generally, like I said, for ID theft purposes, a good idea. I often talk to tax professionals about it too because they're more worried about having a tax professional account. And I'm like, you know, you're still a taxpayer as well. You should also get a MyFTB account. And then once you have a MyFTB account, if you have a problem, you don't have to call us. You can get online and do a secure chat about your account with someone. If you're an online person, like I am, I like to just get on because then I'm not sitting on hold on the phone. You can open up a chat window, chat with somebody about your account. You can submit correspondence to us through MyFTB. So there's no more mailing that correspondence using the snail mail, having to go get the return receipt request. You can simply submit it. You see that it's been uploaded, and somebody will send you an email correspondence back. So um, it's been hard, I think, trying to get more folks to do things online only because of the security protocols around it. It's not as though it's April 14th, you have a tax question about your account, you can just log right in and, and get an answer if you haven't already created a, uh, an account. It's kind of one of those things, when you need it, you want it. If once you realize you need it, it's too late to kind of think about, oh, I should get that, because it's going to take probably 20 days to get one. So if, you, um, if you're thinking about it at all, I highly suggest that you do that. Um, so let's go back to the apps. We also have, we're also trying to get out some, we have right now the uh, Where's My Refund apps. You can figure out, I think we're trying to get payment apps. We have sort of turned the corner on the electronic filing. We've sort of saturated that market, if you will. I mean, we're never going to get 100%, but I think we're at the point where we have the people who are e-filing, are, you know, are we're not going to get much more in that area. But where we are seeing a lack of uh, e-electronic activity is in e-payments, and we're trying to get more and more people to actually electronically pay. Um, and so using MyFTB is a, also a simpler way of doing that. But we're also trying to get apps out there to help people find easier ways to make a payment. You go, you get your taxes done by a tax professional. They'll probably tell you, oh, here's a voucher. or Because a lot of times they like to get, give you the voucher to let you know when to make the payment. Um, we're trying to get tax professionals on our side as well to help us get more people to electronically pay. I think one of the reasons why people don't electronically pay is because there can be too many hiccups, or at least this is why tax professionals don't recommend it. You know, I, we have not made it idiot proof in the sense that you can't, you know, stop it from, if you double click, you know, you're only supposed to click it one time, and a lot of websites will tell you don't, don't click it more than once. We have people who will click it more than one time, and then you get a double payment. And then it's not as easy for us to just put the money back into the account. Um, so we're trying to work out some of those types of bugs to make it simpler so that you know people aren't making double payments or aren't thinking they made a payment and then they didn't make a payment and all of the various things that happen. Um, 
but that's one of the next frontiers for us, I think, in terms of um, moving things you know, onto the electronic side is getting more folks to electronically pay. Um, how we communicate with you, I think I mentioned this already in just the sense of um, there's a lot of calls, there's a lot of concern about how taxing agencies are communicating with people. We're not calling and demanding that you meet us in a parking lot with a gift card. Um, we're not, you know, uh, calling and saying, if you don't pay us right now, we're going to arrest you. We do make outbound calls and collections occasionally. Um, for the most part, though, if we're making a call to you, we've sent you probably a half a dozen letters at least. I think what happens a lot of times is the problem, people aren't getting the mail, they move around a lot, we don't have the proper change of address. We have some, we have some technical challenge, I'd say, with making sure we have the proper address for folks as well. Because we get address information from DMV, we get it from LexisNexis, we get it from you know, other state agencies. And so trying to figure out what is the correct address for you sometimes can be challenging. So there are times when we call folks out of the blue, but at the same time, I hope you know you would realize that to be cautious with giving out your personal information over the phone to anyone, um, and you can always ask for you know to call to get somebody's number to call them back, or you know look on our website to make sure that the person is who they say they are. Or, you know, look in your MyFTB account to see whether you actually owe us money. Why someone might be calling. So all good reasons. All right, fraud and identity theft. Um, this is my last slide. We have a difference between tax fraud and ID theft. Tax fraud is general when people, um, they uh, alter W-2s. It happens quite a bit. And sometimes it's the person whose W-2 it is, and sometimes it's somebody else. But we have a lot of issues with altered W-2s. We had one year where we had some folks, and this was ID theft, which ID theft is something different when somebody who is not you files return using your social security number. Um, and that year, we had a bunch of people who were making credit card payments, and then they would file a return and get all the money that, you know, from the credit card. Before we realized that the credit cards were stolen, they were getting back huge refunds. Um, there are so many schemes that happen, um, and it feels like they, as soon as we put one, you know, like a dam with a bunch of holes, as soon as you plug one, another one spout, you know, starts. Um, so trying to keep on top of identity theft and tax fraud has been very challenging for the department. It's why we keep, you know, the, the address as the holy grail of what we have. Um, because fraud and ID theft is real. Tax professionals, I'm constantly telling them, you are a gold mine for fraud and ID theft because all you have are social security numbers and information about people that, that, that these folks want, that they're willing to pay for, that information that's on your hard drive. So trying to tell tax professionals to make sure that they use encrypted software, that they maintain strong passwords, that they don't use, you know, Starbucks Wi-Fi to prepare returns and all of these things because they have your data. Yet another reason to fully vet your tax professional and make sure that they are keeping your data safe because if you're giving over that important information to them, you need to make sure that they're treating it with the utmost care and confidentiality. Um, but ID theft is still a concern for us and it's one of the reasons why um, tax returns or refunds, I'm sorry, tax refunds can sometimes be slower coming out. We had a bunch of folks last year, um, we have a program where if your company has been breached, you know, or if you're an accountant, you're, you're, you know, you've lost taxpayer information. There was a scam last year where people were calling companies and posing as the CFO and asking for all of the uh, social security number and, and employee names, and people were giving that information out. So they had, uh, we got a bunch of calls from, from uh, taxpayers businesses saying, you know, I've, our, our a company's been hacked or we accidentally gave, you know, all this information out. Angry tax professionals calling us and saying, you know, my client, I've had the same client for 10 years, same W-2, same wages, same withholding, what gifts? Why are we now holding this refund for, you know, 30 days? Uh, because we have to do the, we have to take those extra steps to make sure that it's not tax fraud, that it's not ID theft. And I was telling, you know, folks, I said, it used to be, some of you probably don't remember this, but before 9-11, you could show up at the airport, as long as you got there 10 minutes before the plane left, everything was good. You know, you just kind of got in there and, and went. But now, because of the, you know, of the bombings and whatnot, we all sort of pay the price for security. 
This morning I got to the airport two hours early because I got to get through, you know, the, the, the check and take off the shoes and, you know, all of the, the security screening. And it's the price we all pay for security. And it's sort of the same thing with refunds, I think. We have to accept the fact that we can't get refunds like that now because we also have to make sure that we're looking for identity theft and making sure that people are protected. And so it's kind of one of those things that we, um, we give up for the greater good. Um, but ID theft and fraud is still um, a huge issue. It's easy for people to commit these sorts of crimes. There's not a lot of downside. So make sure you protect your tax information. And above all, if you can, sign up for a MyFTB account so that you can, you can monitor your own information and make sure that you're um, not being, become a victim of fraud or identity theft. All right, and with that, I have time for questions. If anybody has any, anyone? Ah, yes. So the FTB account. Yes. How long do you, uh, does it hold your information? Uh, I think we have a seven-year retention policy for electronic data, um, and I don't know exactly how far if it will go back before longer than seven years, but we have a general seven-year data retention policy. So, yeah. So at the beginning of the lecture, you yeah. said um, that somebody, a taxpayer in the top 500, they yes. get their uh, license suspended to their yes. medical license. So how yes. are they supposed to pay those taxes if they're not able to practice? So that's actually a good question. A lot of times we try to work with folks. So if you're in the top 500 and you've had your driver's license or medical license or bar license or any of those suspended, that is a very good question because we want them to pay the tax. And so oftentimes what we try to do is work with them either to get them into an installment agreement so that they can get off that list and we don't take their license away. But a lot of times it's, it's the last ditch effort because these are folks that, that owe us in excess of $100,000. So trying to get them to work with us either to come to an agreement about how much they owe, because sometimes that's what the issue is, but oftentimes just getting them into some sort of payment plan to get them to pay off that liability is what we try to do. Well, yes. Yeah. Oh. oh, do you want? No, please. Okay, go ahead. Um, for 2018. For 2018, um, are we still able to write off uh, investment expenses? No. You're talking about on the Schedule A, itemized yeah. deductions. Hey, right. Okay. Yeah. You've answered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of those 2%, um, those 2 deductions went away. Yes, you have a question back there? Um, you talked about uh, how when people don't pay taxes, yes. but they have a license in California. Yeah you'll sort of calculate what you expect them to owe uh -huh. and send that to the address they have on file. Yes. But if, for example, you moved out of state, but uh -huh. you still have that California license, um, what sort of happens with that? Do they just not, I mean, they don't have to pay? Or um, One of the, I guess one of the things that people have suggested is why are we not getting the address information from the licensee because the, from the licensing agency? Because if I moved out of California and I saw my CPA license, I would update it with the Board of Accountancy here in California. We just didn't have that ability to exchange that address information with the Board of Accountancy, but we have really um, made some changes in how we get what we call the best address for a taxpayer. So we get addresses from all different um, places of information all different places. We get that information from all different places. Um, but the reality is a lot of people do not get those notices from us. And that's a problem because then they don't find out until we've levied their bank account. And that happens more often than I'd like to admit. Did you have a question? Hi, so you said that many of our tax laws are voted on, but that mm -hmm. people don't understand tax laws. So how is that process fair, and if so, like, how can we remedy that? Um, so some tax laws are voted on by the by public, and it, it's a ballot measure. You know, somebody will get enough signatures to put something on a ballot. That's how the the ballot process works. Um, but a lot of times, because taxes either raise or lower um, the the budget, you know, either we're, we're Raising taxes increases, you know, funds for the budget. A lot of tax law is done through the budgeting process. 
Um, and some of it's done, you know, for administrative purposes. But I think what was your question is that how do we fix that or? Like how do we fix that if people are voting on things they don't understand? <laughs> that is a really great question. I don't know, not just tax law, but all kinds of things that we vote on. Half of the time, I don't understand what the bond measure is for or, you know, what a lot of the different things. I can list a whole laundry list of, of propositions that I voted on this last time that I was sketchy about what, what it actually meant. And I, and I honestly, that is a very good question. It would be really nice if the things that we voted on were more clear as to what, it, what the actual outcome was gonna be. But the process itself, I think, is broken, only in the sense that a lot of times it's rushed so quickly. You have people who are lobbying for or against. A lot of times it's special interests that will get things on a ballot. And they really just tell you what they want you to hear, unfortunately. And I don't, unless you have a lot of time to spend, especially given the number of propositions that were on the last ballot, unless you have a lot of time to spend, I don't know how it's possible for a person to completely understand everything that's on that ballot unless you spend you know, a week and a half researching every single one of them. So I would say the process is somewhat broken in that respect. Yeah, that's a very good comment. Be, be as informed as you can. How far does it go uh, full piggy bank on, uh, on taxes? Just have a set percentage of the federal number and be done with it. <sighs> that is a very good question. That would probably be one best for the lawmaker, but I will take a stab at what I think. Um, there are too many uh, pet projects, if you will, things that people have decided that they want. Um, you have too many things that have been earmarked. You know, a lot of times they pass you know, like for example, the 1% mental health services tax. If we do away with that, the funding for that goes away. I mean, how would you figure out what that percentage was going to be? It would be, it would be a mass overhaul project that would require a lot of bipartisanship, you know, and I just, I, I just don't see it happening. People working together from both sides of the aisle to determine how the money's gonna be spent um, and how much it's gonna be because again, if we're talking about flat tax, you know, that if you're, as I even mentioned, it's sort of a pay as you, not a pay as you go, it's a uh, uh, ability to pay system. Mm -hmm. You know, people who make less money pay a much lower percentage of taxes, and the more you make, the higher the percentage. And I don't know how that would work in the type of system that you're talking about with, you know, just a percentage of federal. So I think there's, it would take a lot. It would take a lot, and I, you know, I don't know. We'll see what the what the legislature wants to do this this session because we're going to be talking about conformity to tax cuts and job acts, and I think there are going to be some big deal breakers. I mentioned a few of them: um, cash versus accrual accounting and technical terminations on the business side, which really tend to get people heated and starting to talk to their legislature about stuff. So perhaps we'll get some bills. But last in the last session. It was really about the SALT limitations with state and local tax, you know, that, that $10,000 limitation. And, and I feel like in some ways it's more, um, uh, you know, the politics of it. You know, we just, we don't, whatever Trump says, you know, California doesn't want to do and we're going to fight against that. And, and until we kind of get away from that and figure out what is the best for the state, but I think even that's problematic because people don't agree what the best thing is for the state. And so trying to create any mass overhaul like that is, is yeah, I don't know that it would ever happen. I, we, we can't even get conformity to the federal. And, and not, I'm talking before tax cuts and job acts. For many, many years, we're like, we need to conform, we need to conform. And we just get, we get piecemeal conformity. A little bit here, a little bit there. It's never like a, you know, a whole, uh, you know, date change type of a thing. I mean, we did get one of those recently, but... Um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. So, well, I want to thank you for oh. informative presentation. <laughs>